Uh, we just want you to know that you belong here and that you can jump right into community here. Uh, speaking of community, we would love for you, if this is your first time, to go ahead and go to our Connect spot. Tell us your name, a little bit of information about you. Not so we can spam you, but just so we can get you connected with different events and groups that we have here at Gateway Church in South Austin. We would love to get your information. So go to the Connect spot, fill out one of those Connect cards online if you can, and we would love to put a free gift in your hands. Again, jumping into community. Uh, and we love to celebrate our community. And in honor of Black History Month, we want to celebrate a special family to us, specifically Don Tate. If you don't know Don, Don is an author. He is an illustrator. He is an award winner, y'all. And, um, and Don, actually, he writes a lot of children's stories, and one of the subjects he loves to highlight are little-known or unknown uh, black heroes in American history. So we wanted to highlight that him and his wife, Tammy, have been a part of our community for years. Our son, Kobe, grew up in our youth ministry and is now leading in our college network. So we wanted to celebrate him this morning. Awesome. Yeah, give it, a, give it up for them. Well, hey, at this time, we want to invite you in giving uh, today. Again, if this is your first time, feel absolutely no obligation to give. We just want you to experience uh, God and some people uh, this morning. But if you do call Gateway Church your home, uh, just know that your giving makes a difference. Like we always say, not just here in Austin, but around the world. In fact, we opened up with a prayer this morning for the Ukraine. And if, in case you didn't know, we have partners already there. We've been working with Ker Kirby Homes for years with Storyline in the Ukraine and in Central Europe. And right now, we're assessing and figuring out what ways we can help aid and bring relief, whether that's monetarily, whether that's sending, whatever uh, we can do. So we're monitoring that right now and gathering some more information. But just know some of your giving already goes to those efforts and the churches and the pastors and the nonprofits in Ukraine. So we'll let you know a little bit more about that if you'd like to give to that. But just know some of your giving already goes to some of these amazing, amazing nonprofits uh, and people that we partner with. So thank you so much. If you'd like to give today, you can uh, do so by either giving on your way out or uh, following the instructions on the screen behind me and it'd help you give automatically like me and my family do. Well, hey, we are continuing today our series on reframing God. Uh, and last week we talked about the Trinity. This week we're gonna be talking about prayer. And I don't know how you grew up, but prayer can sometimes seem uh, a little disconnected, maybe a little too holy or too heady. And we don't know what to say. It can feel a little awkward. But oftentimes we forget that it's about a conversation. It's about a relationship. And so we wanted to illustrate that for you this morning. Beloved one, it's been a long week. So many things came up and seemed pressing and urgent. We had plans to connect and it seemed like there was always something that needed tending to. The list of to-dos never ending and eternally adding up. I know it's overwhelming. I see how you're tired and in need of some rest. So let's press pause and step away for a time. Don't worry, the list will still be there tomorrow. Would you come away with me? Come find me in the place that gives your soul true refreshment and allow me to lead you beside still waters. How I long to be with you, to spend time just us together. Come share with me how your week went. What are you celebrating today? What were the highlights and greatest moments of joy this week? Or does your heart feel heavy and your head downcast? My child, are you carrying burdens that were never meant for you to bear alone? Allow me to take the weight of those things and in their place, give you my yoke, which is easy to bear because my burden is light. Know this, I never despise you asking for help in your weakness and need. For my strength is made perfect in the place where my children humble themselves and pray and petition for the desires of their heart. Come find me in the secret place. Come let me exchange the weight of this world for my perfect peace. Beloved, I know how overwhelming this life can get how there are only so many hours in a day and how they seem to get filled up so quickly. But would you accept my invitation to come away with me and reconnect? I want to remind you who I am in the midst of everything you are facing, to right-size your perspective and reassure you of my presence and how I go before you and behind and surround you on all sides. Time spent with you is the thing I look forward to all day long. If you knew how it brings my heart such joy and delight, how precious are your thoughts to me, dear one. 
I want to talk with you, to dwell with you, to reassure you of how deeply you are loved. That's all prayer was ever meant to be, really. I only ever wanted it to be a conversation with my child, to pull up a chair, share a cup of coffee, and remind you, I care about it all. Every detail matters to me, and nothing is hidden from my sight. So I'm here, and I'm not going anywhere. Whenever you're ready to get still, just know I can't wait to meet with you. Well, hello, everybody. Good morning. Good to see you guys. So anybody ready to go to a nice river, get a nice cup of pour over coffee and hang out? <laughs> when I watched that, I was like, that is exactly where I want to be. And yet at the same time, that is so different than my normal everyday pace of life. It reminded me kind of like something you might do on vacation, right? Like, that's the kind of thing that you might get to do if you sit aside time on vacation. But the reality is, is that in our normal everyday lives, that isn't really what it looks like, at least not in my life. I don't know if any of you can relate to that. That's not every day for me. Our lives are actually pretty busy. We're actually running at a pretty fast pace. And so getting time with God can sometimes feel like a luxury. It can sometimes feel like something we do on vacation but doesn't really feel like our reality. Our reality is much busier. Just like the video said, the video said that, that we're busy, that we're hustling and we're bustling. Anybody relate to that? Have a busy week this week? Have a lot going on? Jump up out of bed and you're on your feet and you're out the door and your to-do list is running. I believe that we're all kind of moving at a pace of life that feels very reactionary. We're reacting oftentimes, and I think that some of us can start to feel overwhelmed. Anybody feeling overwhelmed as you get the come in here this morning and finish up your week can also leave us feeling really tired. Anybody trying to catch up on some sleep and some rest? That's the pace we're running, and we're just oftentimes trying to react to what's being thrown at us. And I believe that the pace of life that we oftentimes don't necessarily set out to do, we'd rather be doing that. <laughs> Tell the truth, we'd rather our lives look like that. So aren't you attracted? Like if you see videos like that, aren't you attracted to that idea? Secretly, I have this attraction to slowing down and just sitting by a nice fire and reading a book. So I go and I buy the books, but that never happens. And so I have this pile of books that I was like, in my head, the idea of slowing down and reading them sounded really good, but the actual act of doing that felt like a luxury I couldn't afford. Anybody relate with that? Things that you want to do and you imagine doing them, you fantasize about doing them, but then it's like life just goes and you can't do it because you're too busy. But when we get caught up in this reactionary way of life, I believe that one of the consequences of it is that it has the power to really shape and mold our view of God. When we are just reacting to life, that can force us into this view of just reacting to our circumstances and allowing our circumstances and this fast pace of life to determine how we see God. Right now, we're in this series called Reframing God. And today we are going to talk about prayer and about the role that prayer can play in our lives if we'll let it in reframing God in a daily way. I believe that we're being invited to shift from a reactive approach to our relationship with God and to our prayer lives to a proactive approach. And so today that's what we're going to explore together and we're going to talk about I know that many of you in here, as you come in today, you're probably coming from a busy week. So you're probably thinking, okay, yeah, how's that going to happen? It sounds good in theory, but how am I really going to be able to make that shift? Sometimes those things can feel harder than what we have the space and the capacity to do. 
But as we look at this, I believe that God has something for us here. I believe that as we look at this, we can see and relate with God in a new way. And as we see and relate with him in a new and proactive way, I believe that how we view God, the reframing of our view of God has the power to transform every area of our lives. Now, I didn't introduce myself at the beginning. I just, some of you I may know, some of you I don't know. My name is Jamie Schwartz. I've been here at Gateway for quite a while. And one of the things that I do here is help oversee our recovery group, our recovery program. So the story I'm about to tell is a story that took place a while back, kind of in my early 20s. So uh, it does not represent who I am today, just know that. Um, but it's, a, it's, a, it's kind of like me telling on myself a little bit, but I think it's, a, it's worth telling because it illustrates something really important as we get started this morning. So when I was in my early 20s, I was going through a very transformational time in my life. A lot of transition was happening. So I was a new mom, just had a baby, had gotten married recently, brand new marriage, and I also had just started a relationship with Jesus, had just started following Jesus. So I had these three pretty major, I mean, wouldn't you guys say that? That's a pretty significant life change in a short window of time. And yet in the midst of that, of course, I was new to all of these things. And you imagine when you're new to something, right? You need to learn how to do it. I was trying to figure out how to be a mom, how to be a wife, and how to follow Jesus. And so of course, like most of us do, we look around. What are other people doing? I looked around at what other Christians were doing, and I noticed pretty quickly, okay, Christians pray. They pray every week at church, multiple times in a the morning. They pray when, you know, they tell you they're going to pray for you, whatever. So like, okay, I'm supposed to be praying, right? So that's what I decided to do. Now, I liked the idea that you could just talk to God. That was kind of cool to me, because the only prayer I had been familiar with were like, prayers that you memorize and say. I didn't know that you could actually just have a conversation with God. And so when I started having a conversation with God, when I remembered, let's say, to have a conversation with God, it usually revolved around when I was mad at my husband. For whatever reason, it was when I was mad at my husband that I remembered I needed to talk to God. <laughs> and that happened uh, pretty frequently early on in our marriage. We were mad at each other a lot, or at least I was mad at him. And so every time something would happen in my marriage and I would get mad at my husband, that would be like, you know what, I'm going to go talk to God about this. And so I'd go in my prayer and I would be like, God, Corey, that's my husband, is so mean. Can you believe what he just said to me? I would complain to God about Corey and I would just grieve and tell him all the things that Corey was doing wrong. One of my, uh, one of my really pet peeves was Corey's family has a history of heart disease. And so I was like going through all of this work to try to cook him these really healthy meals. If you're a man in the room, you're probably like, oh boy. <laughs> yeah, I was like doing the thing. And I would cook these meals and then Corey would just look at it and be like, mm, I think I'm not hungry, which is not true because he is hungry all the time. And I would get so hurt and so mad and I'd go to God and I'm like, I'm cooking him these healthy meals and he won't even eat them. That's what my prayer life pretty much looked like at that time. <laughs> it was all complaining about Corey. And I just continued to do that. And finally, around this time, I had also started a 12-step recovery. I'd gotten a sponsor and I was working through recovery and I went to my sponsor and I basically was like, I am so frustrated. I was so angry. First of all, I was angry at the fact that everybody told me prayer is powerful and it worked and it wasn't working. Corey was not changing. Corey was still the same. Nothing was changing. And so I went to my sponsor and she was asking me how I was doing. And I was like, I'm not doing great. I was getting into recovery and working on my anger issues, and this was just making it worse. Prayer was making me angrier because it wasn't doing what I thought it was supposed to do. And so I told her, and she patiently and graciously listened to me. I'm sure she might have been laughing a little bit internally at me, but she listened, empathized, and then she said, Jamie, will you say the serenity prayer with me? Now, if you're in recovery or you've ever been a part of recovery, you know that the serenity prayer is a part of recovery and it's some, a tool that we often use in recovery. And so she asked me, 
will you say it with me? And I was like, sure, fine, more prayer, let's go. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. And as I prayed that, she then followed it up with some questions. She said, Jamie, do you think that you can change God? No, I cannot change God. <laughs> I don't have that kind of power. Okay. Then she asked, what about Corey? Do you think you can change Corey? Well, I had actually been trying that and it wasn't working out for me so well. So no, I cannot change Corey. Evidently, I don't have that power either. And then she asked, but what about you? Is there anything you can do to change you? Mm, okay, yes, I probably can do that. I was reluctantly agreeing, yeah, I do have the power to make some changes in my life. And then she said, why don't you start praying to God and asking him to help you work on you? Ask God to help you do the thing you can. Work on you and ask him for his help to help you become who he's created you to be. Well, I reluctantly agreed and I started doing that. And as I started to do that, guess what, guys? <laughs> Change started to happen, but not in Corey, in me. I started to change. My perspective started to change. My relationship with God started to change. My relationship and how I saw myself started to change. And how I saw and treated Corey started to change. I began to pray prayers like, confessing to God my impatience with Corey and asking him to help me practice patience. I prayed acknowledging my selfish desire to control Corey and ask God to help me respect Corey's free will. I prayed prayers admitting to God that I had issues trusting him, that I would struggle to trust him, that I had doubts about him and ask him to help me understand him better and to strengthen my faith in him. And as I prayed this way and started to shift in praying and asking for God to work in me, to change me, I began to change and to grow and to mature. It was working. And as that happened, my relationship with God began to change and grow and mature. And I viewed God differently. And as that happened, I started to treat and talk to and look at Corey differently. And our relationship began to dramatically change because guess what? As I changed and talked to Corey differently and treated him differently, Corey changed, not because I was forcing him to do anything, but because it inspired change in him when he saw the change in me. As I look back on that, those early years, I am so grateful for my sponsor. I'm so grateful for the conversation that she had with me. I'm grateful that she was teaching me how to pray and helping as she taught me how to pray and patiently came alongside me, helping my relationship with God to be transformed. She helped transform through teaching me about prayer, my perspective of God. I came out of that with a renewed and reframed relationship with God. So as we focus on prayer today, we're not going to be able to cover all of the facets and functions of prayer. We're gonna focus in on two main things. We're gonna focus on God's heart for prayer. And we're also gonna focus on the model of Jesus's call to prayer. Because I believe that these two areas have the power to help reframe how we view God and how we relate with God through prayer. So before we do that, I just want to ask you to stop for a second and pray with me. Oh, God, we acknowledge that there is still so much we don't know. So much we don't understand about you. So much that maybe we've gotten wrong. 
ways we maybe have believed things that weren't true. We're misunderstanding things that we heard or saw. Maybe we've made judgments against you, but as we all come here this morning, God, we're coming for one reason, and that's you. We're coming because we want to know you. We want to understand you better. We are open to having our view of you reframed to a more truthful and accurate depiction of who you are. So we just invite you into our lives personally and collectively and ask you to speak to us and meet with us here through this message, through your word, and through our time together. God, we are listening. Will you speak? We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's start with God's heart towards prayer. Now, as we know, God is vast. He's infinite. He's a very big God. So to try to cover, again, all of the ways that we can communicate and talk with God, uh, that's way too much than we have time or words to even do. So as we go into his heart for prayer and as we explore, we're going to focus on three different aspects of his heart for prayer. So the first one is God wants to be known. God wants to be known. From the beginning, humans, us, we were created for relationship with God. We were created to be in relationship with him, to be known and to know him and each other. However, as we have rebelled, as humanity has rebelled against God and gone our own way, we've lost knowledge of God and even sometimes the desire to know him. And so God, on the other hand, has never stopped seeking, pursuing, and loving us. He has continued to come after us. And the truth is God is not elusive by nature. He doesn't hide from us. His desire has always been to know you and be known by you. God pursues us. He is knowable. We can actually know him. And so God has worked through Jesus to bring us back into a restored relationship with him and through him to ultimately begin to restore our communication, restore this relationship. Prayer becomes the communication between us and God, the way that we learn and grow and know God and we communicate back to God. It's about being known and knowing him. Jeremiah 29, 12 through 13 says, then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. God wants to be known by you. The next aspect of God's heart towards prayer is alignment with God. God wants to bring us back into alignment with him. God wants to restore us to unity and harmony with his will and his ways. As we grow in learning and knowing more about God, it's vital that we actually start to align ourselves with him. If we're not careful, we can very easily move forward in our spiritual journey with the notion that God conforms to us instead of us learning how to follow God and be restored to the image that he has for us, to be restored to who he creates and calls us to be. When we struggle with things like addiction, it's very easy in the midst of that for us to think God's not with us, but he is. God is with us in that place. And the whole time we are moving through hard things, God is wooing us back to him, back into alignment with him because he knows that his ways and his will are good for our lives. They're good for us. And so God is constantly seeking to realign us with him to help us to get back into alignment with him. I have a question. Do you trust yourself fully with your whole life? Do you trust yourself fully with all aspects of your life? 
I know I don't. I've proven to myself many, many times that I am not fully trustworthy in that regard because I know the messes that I make when I have been in full control. I know the mistakes and the ways that I failed. But what is so beautiful is that God is calling us back to him, inviting us to come back to him, and that we don't have to do this alone, that we were never designed to do this alone, that when we bring ourselves into alignment with him, he shows us a better way. He shows us his way. But we have to be willing to first willingly realign with God, willingly recognize that his ways are better than our ways. Prayer can be the simple, humble act of saying, I cannot do this on my own. God, I need your help to lead me and to guide me through this life. And when we pray prayers like that, we're actively seeking to realign ourselves with God and his goodwill in ways. 1 John 5, 14 through 15 says, this is the confidence that we have in approaching God that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we've asked of him. Prayer is not a communication tool that we use to just get God to do what we want, to be our genie in a bottle. Prayer is the communication tool that we get to use, that God uses to change and transform us. It's a tool that helps to realign us regularly with God's will and ways for our life. And our last way that we aspect of God's heart for prayer is that God wants healthy relationship with us. God wants healthy relationship with you. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18 says, Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. What this is saying is that all healthy relationships, including human ones, require consistency. They require consistency. For example, if you were married, some of you may be married, so this may be like really close to home for you, but if you were married and you celebrated your spouse on their birthday, maybe on Valentine's Day, on Christmas. Let's say you get really crazy and you start celebrating them for all of like your little anniversaries. First time you guys went on a date, first time you held hands, first time you kissed. Maybe you have kids and you're celebrating your spouse even on the day of your kid's birth and you have all of these different days throughout the year. You're still only celebrating them a handful of times out of 365 days a year. If that's all you did, you might feel pretty good about the cards, the flowers, the candy, the maybe the special vacation. But if that was it, that's not a very consistent relationship and not a very consistent way of communicating and showing love to the person that you're supposed to love the most. What if we shift that to our relationship with God? What if we think about going to church? Maybe we go to church once a month. Maybe we go on Christmas and Easter. And then add to that maybe the few times or the times throughout the year that we do actually talk and pray or stop and spend time with God. There's still 300 plus days a year that we maybe haven't been. And that reminds us of something important. We can have a relationship with God that isn't healthy because we're not engaging with it. If you had a human relationship that you didn't spend that kind of time and attention on, you know the breakdown would start to happen. Maybe some of you are experiencing that right now. As distance grows in relationships, it doesn't help the relationship, it hurts it. It leads it to start to decay and destroy. And when we think about relationship with God, God doesn't want us some of the time. He wants a consistent relationship with you and me. He wants to engage with us regularly. He wants to have a healthy relationship with us. If God's heart is to have that kind of relationship with us, if his desire is to have all of us all the time, how do we go about trying to not only cultivate that kind of relationship, but to sustain it? 
How do we approach our prayer life thinking we want to have connection with God? I'm going to guess if you're here on a Sunday morning and you got out of bed and you chose to come here, you want a relationship with God, but you also come up against obstacles that get in the way of you having a consistent relationship with God. We all do. So when we think about how do we get answers to our questions, what does it look like to have a healthy relationship with God? What does it look like to have an appropriate relationship with God? To have a relationship that pleases God. I think there's no better place for us to look than to the model that Jesus set for us. So that's where we're going to look. We're going to look at Jesus's model of prayer, and we're going to break that down because my goal is that as you walk out of here today, you feel equipped and empowered. Whatever way you might have walked in, feeling discouraged or distant from God, I pray that through this time and really taking this prayer seriously, that you will walk out of here hopeful, encouraged, and feeling equipped. In the book of Matthew, Jesus is teaching his disciples how to pray, and he models a proactive way of praying and connecting with God daily. And so let's look at that together. We're going to read through it, and then we're going to break it down. Matthew 6. So this is also found in Luke, but we're going to be focusing on Matthew. Matthew chapter 6, verses 6 through 13. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep babbling on like pagans, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them. For your father knows what you need before you even ask him. This then is how you should pray. Our father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Before he even starts to pray, Jesus addresses how we approach prayer, our motive, how we're coming to that prayer. And he's not making a judgment between public and private prayer as if one's better than the other. He's actually focusing instead on helping us understand how we come to prayer, the type of relationship that we are meant to have. This is about relationship. And he, he says that as we're praying, he wants us to remember who God is. He wants us to align with God and to draw near to him. It's not about being super spiritual. It's not about being seen and having everybody hear how great you are and how eloquent your prayers are. It's not about achieving some sort of power or position. And it's not about performance. We see Jesus is approaching God already, communicating him as father. And that's setting the tone for us if that's how he's calling us to come to God. That is the relational dynamic that he wants us to remember daily as we come to God. God is our father. And when you think about coming to God, trying to prove something, trying to show him how awesome your prayers are, it feels more like a performance. It feels more like you're trying to show God how good you are because like an employer, an employee relationship, if you perform well, then he has to answer your prayers. Then he has to bless you. And that kind of relationship is conditional then upon your performance, on how you show up. And maybe you think you're pretty good some of the time, but what about the days you're not good? That's not the kind of relationship Jesus is reflecting here. He's reflecting a father-child relationship. God as the father, you as the child coming to your father. If a child messes up, if a child falls short, if a child just doesn't do something well, does the father fire them from the family? Not a loving father. Instead, he helps to restore them. And this is the nature of the way that we are called to come to God. Not trying to prove ourselves, knowing that we're already loved, knowing that God wants us to bring all of it to him as a child to a father. And he responds to us as such. 
So Jesus is calling us to approach God daily, to approach him quietly and privately as a loving father who we are seeking to connect and draw near to. And this type of approach is proactive relationship building. It's not waiting until everything's falling apart. It's not waiting until God seems like a big, angry man. It's not waiting for that. It's approaching him knowing every day, you're my father and you love me. How might approaching God this way, approaching him as a father, approaching him daily and reframing your perspective of him daily affect you and affect how you approach your day? How might it affect your connection with him? Now, as Jesus starts his prayer, I want you to notice a few things. Jesus's prayer reflects what he himself values, what he himself has already said is the greatest command. It starts the first half, love God, and the second half, love people. So this prayer is in this order intentionally. It's not an accident that it models after that very important command in scripture. And I also want you to notice that he doesn't say me or my, he says we, he's talking about our, us. This is also intentional, knowing that, remember, this isn't just about you. It's not just about you. God is not just your father. He's our father, and you are a part of God's family. It's easy to make our relationship just about us and God. But when we do that, we totally negate the bigger purpose of our lives is to be included in the family of God. You are invited and included into God's family. And so when Jesus prays, he prays accordingly. He doesn't pray about me. He prays about us. He prays about our, and he's remembering that because that's something that we need to remember. And as Jesus shared this prayer, it's reasonable to believe that he was teaching them how to pray daily, that his expectation was that they would take this prayer and that they would daily pray through this prayer, that they would daily meditate on this prayer, and that this would daily be a tool that helped them to come back and reframe how they view God and how they view their day. How many of you wake up and you, I mean, I know some of you probably do actually wake up really happy and joyful. And I, I have one of those in my household. <laughs> it's not me. Um, but how many of you actually wake up in just a really great place in the morning and you just go into your day all full of Jesus and you just love people really well and you are just so good and so ready for the day? Maybe every once in a while I have that day, but that's not my regular day. This prayer is about choosing to intentionally and proactively prepare for your day. How are you going to see it? How are you going to face it? Are you going to let your circumstances dictate to you how to view your day? Are you going to align with God and let him help reframe how you view and approach your day? All right, as we jump in, Jesus starts with our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Going back to the our Father again, he's reiterating the same thing over again to us. We're coming to God as a Father. This is clearly important because he continues to reference it. And then he prays for God's name to be hallowed, meaning holy, unique, and set apart. Jesus is ultimately praying for God's name, for his image, his reputation to be restored throughout the earth, to be restored to its rightful place. But why? What has happened that God's name has been in some way stained? What has happened that God's reputation and his image has been somehow distorted within the earth? Well, let's start by remembering that God created us for relationship with him and he wants us to know him. And he wants us to not just know him, but to know him as he truly is. God also created humans in his image to bear his image. We're his image bearers here on earth. We're called to be his representatives among the earth. But what happens to someone's image and their reputation and good name when those who were set to represent them don't do it well? When those who were set to represent them represent them falsely. We know what happens. Maybe some of you have had this happen because what happens is that their name and their reputation are damaged and distorted. 
Anybody have ever had that happen to you where your name and reputation was falsely damaged and distorted because somebody communicated or represented you falsely? As God's image bearers, humanity has rebelled against God. And because of that, it's led to this misrepresentation and faulty understanding of God. But Jesus came to be the perfect human, the perfect image of God, the perfect representation of God here on earth. And through Jesus, God made a way for his image bearers, that's all of us, to be restored into right relationship with him, to be restored into that relationship and alignment with him as we live out of this restored relationship And as we continue to live in alignment with God's will for our lives, we get to become an active part of restoring Jesus's name, his image, his reputation here on earth by living that out. Next, Jesus goes on to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Here, he's praying for and reminding us of the goal of full reconciliation and restoration between God and humans, between heaven and earth. God cares about restoration. Do you ever have that question come up here? God, do you see this? Do you care about this? He cares. He has a number one goal of complete restoration between us and him, between heaven and earth. That is his goal. And Jesus is praying towards this end consistently and faithfully. It's easy for us to start our days getting caught up in our to-do list, just going and doing and doing and losing sight of the bigger picture and the greater meaning of our lives, what we are called to in Christ. But by praying and meditating on these words daily, we are reminded of something bigger and higher that we get to be a part of. This is meant to renew your perspective daily so you don't get so focused on the details that you forget that you're a child of God and that you are here as a part of a bigger purpose, that your life does have meaning. You have meaning. How you live today has meaning. And it's infused right here. So when we start our day like this, that's what happens to us. We're remembering. And as we remember, we're being infused with meaning and purpose so that we know our lives are not meaningless. Today is not meaningless. It has purpose. Next, we see him pray, give us today our daily bread. Anybody recognize a story from the Bible where people had to rely on God for their daily bread? The Israelites going through the wilderness, God was providing for them. He provided something called manna. And it was like a kind of like a wafer type thing. But every day they had to wait. They had to rely on God to provide this for them. And they couldn't store it up because if they tried to store it up, guess what happened? It would rot. So it wasn't any good. So it was besides the purpose. But what this time period taught them is that all of their good gifts come from God. That God is their provider. And it taught them how to rely on him and to trust him for their daily provision. All good gifts come from God. And this part of the prayer is challenging to us to reframe how we look at our stuff. Now, if you might feel comfortable sometimes, you know, having your stuff, if you've, you know, compiled a lot of stuff, you have plenty of food in the fridge, You might not feel the same way, like, "Eh, I don't really need to worry about my daily bread. I've got that covered. I've got a house, got car, I got steady income. I'm good. And as we rely on ourselves like that, we're tempted to be independent and just focus on relying on ourselves. But if the last few years have taught us anything, it's that the things that we rely heavily on, the things that we think are so secure, are not. And that things can change quickly without us having any warning. And so the reality is, is that all good gifts come from God. And you know what happens when you know that your stuff, that the stuff you have has been given to you as a gift from God, that your very life and existence is a gift from God. You remember God's generous. He's a generous father. 
And when you remember that your stuff is a gift from God and he's a generous father and you're grateful for the life that you have, you know what it inspires in us? To be generous children. To have a different view of our stuff. To not constantly be worrying about getting more stuff, but to actually be willing to share what we have. And when we do that, we begin to actually look like our heavenly father. And we need to be reminded of that daily because we live in a world that's so obsessed with stuff and so obsessed with having more stuff that we can easily get caught up in that cycle and not realize that it is a privilege to have what we have and it is a gift to be able to share it. Then he goes on to pray, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. As Jesus was hanging on the cross, not long before he would die, he prays to the father, asking him to forgive his enemies. Jesus consistently modeled forgiveness for us. And we know that he chose to let the justice of God for the sins and the wrongs of all of humanity fall on him so that he in turn could give the grace of God to us, that each one of us who chooses to receive Jesus into our lives is receiving what he's done on our behalf. And when we do that, the grace of God comes into our life and we're receiving it. And there is no evidence No greater evidence that the grace of God has come home in your heart and in your mind than your willingness to forgive the way that you've been forgiven. When you forgive the way that you've been forgiven, it shows you understand what you've been forgiven and you understand what it costs God to forgive you. And you recognize that if Jesus can do it, and if he has chosen to fill me with his spirit, I can do it too. And if we pray this every day, it is a reminder every day, you're forgiven. You are forgiven. And that's what inspires you to be willing to walk in forgiveness as you face your day and the potential to be hurt and offended as you go throughout that day. Lastly, he prays and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. We live in a fallen an imperfect world. And Jesus is addressing that. He's reminding us of that. He acknowledges that we face temptation. He acknowledges that we face opposition. But here Jesus prays specifically for God to help him to resist temptation and to find a way out, to steer him away from it, not towards it. He's asking God, show me another way. Give me a way out so that I don't fall to temptation. We are all tempted every day. It's not if, it's when. But we can walk into our day acting like we're not going to be tempted. I'm good. But here, even Jesus is preparing by saying, lead us not into temptation. He's not waiting to react to the circumstances and temptations the day will come. He is proactively preparing and getting himself ready to face those circumstances and to stand against them and to overcome them. He also is praying for deliverance from evil. He is recognizing that there is opposition in this world that we will face. But God is our protector. And he's the one who will not only see us through things, but he protects us as we walk through them. And so Jesus is looking at him and seeking him to not only guide him through the day, to guide him away from temptation, to help protect him from evil, to help him remain faithful. This isn't just about Jesus not wanting bad things to happen to him, although I'm sure he didn't. He wants to remain faithful to God, and he knows that evil and temptation are both working to get him to be unfaithful. Through this prayer, Jesus isn't waiting to see what kind of troubles the day will throw. He is instead proactively preparing to face them. And I believe that this prayer that we just read is a gift to us. This is the prayer that I believe will help to fully reframe and remind us daily of who God is and our relationship to him, and our place in this world, what we're here to do, the bigger purpose that we serve, as well as aligning our lives with him and seeking him as our protector 
as our guide. My hope is that after going through this together, that you have a renewed and refreshed perspective of this prayer. So often we're aware of this prayer, but we don't view it in the full context of what I really believe that Jesus meant for it to be used. It doesn't mean you have to say the exact words every day, but if you move in that order through that prayer and let that be the guide that you pray through and meditate on, and you really soak in those words every morning, I believe that that prayer has the power. Jesus' words have the power to not only transform your view of God daily, to reframe your view of God daily, but it also has the power to transform every area of your life, the way that you react and engage as you go through your day really does get transformed when you start your day with him. Reframing your day, reframing your mind, reframing how you approach him. So I want to ask you, what area of your life are you wanting to see transformed? What relationship would you like to see change? If each of us began each day, starting with praying and meditating on Jesus's prayer and allow God to come in and reframe how we view and approach him, as well as how we view and approach the world around us. How might this change and transform every area of our lives, every area of your life? Think about that. And how might it change and transform every area that we represent God? the way that we represent God to this world as Christ followers? How might praying this prayer daily, this very simple thing, meditating and praying on this daily and allowing God to reframe us, how might that change us as God's children, as God's family, as his church? How might we be willing to mobilize more and more to love and serve the world around us so that we look like our father, so that we represent him, not just individually well, but collectively well. The only way you and I will ever know is if we try. So my question to you today is, will you, will you try? What do you have to lose? As we get ready to close, the band is going to come back up here. And as they do, we're going to be led in uh, one final reflection song. This song was written from God's perspective to us. It's God speaking to us. And the songwriter, she had been going through a really hard time in her life. A lot of challenges, a lot of just like one thing after the other. And it was really uh, taking its toll on her to the point that she was just struggling with her faith, struggling with who God is. Her her life and her circumstances were just getting so bad that it was affecting how she saw God. And so she had the opportunity. Some friends had this little house on a hill that they rented and they gave her the opportunity to go stay there. So she did in order that she could have some time away to rest, to reflect, and to hear from God. And during that time, she ended up writing the song towards the end as a culmination of what she heard from God, how God spoke to her in that space. And I wanna invite you into that space now. We're not in a house on a hill, but this is a space where we can stop, listen, be still, and let God speak to us. So I wanna invite you to do that now. Just quiet, Be still, and as this song plays, listen and 